This video is all about my Jackstat double bass. People have asked about this bass for years and I've never really done a video about it, so that's what this video is. I will give you all the measurements of this bass. I will even weigh this bass and talk about the characteristics, what this bass costs, what it sells for these days, what I like about it, what I like about modern basses, what maybe I don't like about modern basses, what this bass does well, what I wish it would do otherwise, and just all the nitty gritty, super nerdy stuff you ever wanted to know about this bass. So this bass was made in 1995 by a luthier named Albert Jackstat, Al Jackstat. He is now deceased. I bought it from a wonderful bassist named Eric Snoza, who I had on my podcast several years ago. I will link up to that. And Eric was selling this because he was buying a five string bass with a high C. So Eric had put on this extended fingerboard, which people ask about. This is actually, I will show you here. This is actually a separate piece. He really likes playing up in the stratosphere and he got another bass and he was looking for a home for this one. And he asked me, I think it was in maybe 2005 or 2006, he asked me, do you have any students looking to buy a bass? I have a bass for sale. And I said, I certainly do. I've had a lot of students, very good students, looking for basses over the years. So I picked up this bass and before I even took it to a school to show some of my students, I took it to some gigs to play on, and some of my colleagues said, hey, this bass is like way better than your bass, which was a very nice bass. This uh, bass, I think, attributed to Lowendahl, a wonderful German bass from the late 19th century, Gamba Corner bass, and I decided to buy this, and I paid $17,000 for it in somewhere around 2005, which uh, was a good deal considering, and the cost now, if you go on uh, and look up a Jackstat, it's about double that, well, at least from what I'm finding on the internet. Albert Jackstat passed away a few years ago. He was into his 90s, I believe. So he's obviously not making any more of these bases. And these are really nice bases at what you would consider to be a fairly reasonable price point for a modern instrument that one luthier designed by hand. The going cost for a base like that on the low end these days would probably be in a, around $30,000, give or take a little bit and it just goes up from there. You're finding modern makers asking 50,000, 60,000, probably 70,000. Uh, I don't know that I've heard of a $100,000 uh, new base yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if we cross that threshold soon. If you get much below that, at least here in the United States, you are getting into uh, workshop bases that are made by many people, so maybe in your country of origin, likely in China or somewhere else. I work for a company, Eastman Music Company, that makes such bases, and I've, I don't know if I've done videos exactly about that, but kind of about that. I'll link up to some sort of resource. But the going cost here in the United States, as I film this video, of a base like this would be in the low 30,000s up to the sky's the limit. So this base is what you would consider a 7 8 size base. And the string length is probably the first thing that you want to figure out as I look for my tape measure. The most standard of all, 41 and a half inches. So that is your standard string length uh, for a three-quarter or seven-eighth size base. This is thought of as a seven-eighth size base, though the upper bouts are significantly more tapered than the lower bouts. And we will find out exactly what those measurements are. At its widest point, it looks to be 19 and a half inches for the upper bout. The lower bout is 28 inches, so 19 and 28. That is a significant difference. And now that we've got it down the ground, let's just measure the other stuff. So the, the rib depth, we got nine inches uh, for the lower bout. And that tapers, when we get to the upper bout, we're at eight inches and it tapers at the neck block down to six inches. Uh, so that's quite a taper as well, both on the 
width side, you know, this side, and then also this rib side. So what that does is that allows the base to get a whole heck of a lot closer into the body than it might otherwise, and it makes navigating the upper register a lot easier. A couple other dimensions that might be of interest. This is called the overstand right here on the base. And uh, modern bases are built with a, a decent overstand. It looks like this is a couple inches. Yeah, maybe an inch and a half or so overstand. My Lowendahl base had a very low overstand and that can be a little uncomfortable to get over here. And it has something to do with the uh, projection of the sound. I do not understand the, that is beyond my pay grade, unfortunately. So I weigh, 180 pounds, 181 pounds, and then I hold the base, and I weigh 205 pounds. So what is that? 24 pounds, something like that? A few other things about this base. So it has an extension. And this is a put on by a luthier named Chris Thralkeld Weigand, who is awesome. He is an Iowa, uh, where is he? Iowa City, I think. Drove over there uh, maybe 2006 to have this put on. And because, why not, this goes down to a low B. So we've got the E, E flat, D, C sharp, C, and this is a low B. Now, one cool thing about this base is this uh, fingerboard extension that Eric Snows have put on goes to a high B. So just because it's cool, I can go from this low B to a B here, to a B here, to a B here, here, and the very last note is also a B. So that's just a whole heck of a lot of Bs. <laughs> Extensions are cool and I've done an entire video on, uh, probably more than one video on extensions and their usefulness and how to think about them and why, why you might want one. Uh, I will link up to that, but they are the standard for orchestrally oriented players in the US and they can actually help with wolf tones and even if you're a jazz player having a low E flat. Pretty cool. Other things on this base. These are Sloan tuners. These, I believe, are a 50 to 1 gear ratio, which makes them almost like fine tuners. You can adjust them very, uh, very easily. They are a bummer to change strings with because they normally, I think the gear ratios are about, are typically 20 to 1. So this takes over twice as long, which is why a string crank is useful, which is why I actually over here have a drill set up with a string crank, a D'Addario string crank, which I'll link up to if you're if you're desperately looking for something like that. It's pretty useful. Building materials, this is just totally standard. This is a spruce top, maple ribs, and back. This is a flat back base, which there is debate about whether flat back or round back or whatever back. Just like with everything in the base world, there's not a clear consensus on what's what's good or, or uh, under what conditions. Um, but this base is good and a lot of fun to play and it's got a nice flame to the maple jack stats uh, all generally sound good the ones from the mid 90s like this one i think have a reputation of sounding particularly good i know that owen lee principal basses of the cincinnati symphony he owns one or maybe even two like uh, just one number apart from this one this is like 34 or 35 i don't know if i can even see in the label there let's see 38. And then I've got D'Addario Kaplan's on this bass. This bass sounds good with all kinds of strings, uh, but I, I just happen to have D'Addario Kaplan's on right now. I will link up to a playlist of me using this bass with some other strings, just so you can get an idea of the impact that the strings has on it. I think this bass sounds pretty groovy with most strings. It's got this kind of cool, uh, funky wooden tail piece. I'm not sure what the material is, but Gael McKeon put this on my base. He used to have a shop here in the Bay Area, and I've had him on my podcast multiple times. He's 
interviews. Uh, he interviewed me for my podcast, so I'll link up to some of that. I had this emergency situation in, I think it was 2016, 2017, where I was, I needed to go to a gig. I'd heard a weird sound the night before, and my black ebony kind of standard tailpiece had just cracked in half. I guess it had just over, lasted its useful life and just decided to break in the middle of the night. Gael saved my bacon, put this on, and then did some setup work on my bass. And, and in terms of setup and just stuff about this bass in general, this is a really, uh, easy to maintain bass, which is a great thing to have if you can find it in your life. This bass, back when I lived in Chicago, where there's a lot of temperature and humidity variability, this bass sounded great in January when it was five degrees Fahrenheit, and in the summer when it was 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't think I even switched out to a summer or winter sound post, um, which is really saying something, because usually you have to do that in a climate like that. Now I live in uh, temperate California in San Francisco, where it's generally nice all the time in consistent humidity, so it, uh, but, but even in Chicago, this bass basically sounded the same every month of the year in all weather conditions. And in terms of tone, I would call this tone, it was really nice, kind of, there's nothing, it, it, this is like a, a big, bold, not too complicated, clean, clear sound. That's maybe how I would describe this bass. You've heard this bass a lot, but you'll hear it again. And we probably don't have optimal miking on this because I'm using this lapel mic. Uh, but this, this bass just responds quickly. It has a nice even sound in all registers and across the bass. And it does not seem to need excessive setup and maintenance work. Uh, I always enjoy it when I get it back from the luthier, but I rarely am like, oh my goodness, what's happening with this bass? I gotta take it to the luthier ASAP. I've had that in my life with other basses, and I know a lot of people have, even with very fine basses. So, uh, older basses can kind of be a little bit more like a vintage wine and have some character and complexity to the sound that maybe this bass doesn't have, but what this bass does have is just a clean, clear, full-bodied, big sound. The fact that it is tapered up here and that it's taped, uh, that, that, this angle for the camera, tapered here and tapered here makes it much easier to just get around. And it actually makes the bass kind of sit against my body comfortably when I'm standing. I uh, also sit with this bass a lot when I'm playing an orchestra. I'll sit when I'm practicing and doing these videos. By and large, I'm standing. Uh, I do like to practice standing because I find if I practice standing, I can always sit down. But if I get too used to doing everything sitting, standing becomes a challenge and for a variety of reasons I, I like that. Uh, in terms of some other nerdy things, I have just your standard good old Getz end pen with a screw off tip. I've never changed the end pen on this base. At some point I think I'm going to have to change this mechanism out because I feel like this screw, this Getz screw is slowly dying on me. And when that happens maybe I will take it in and start playing around with end pens. I've had this reluctance to experiment with alternate tunings or strings that are a little too outside the norm, or even like with uh, bent end pins or something like that, for a practical reason, which is that I do a lot of travel and I'm playing on random bases that aren't mine all the time, and I don't want to get too dependent on something that's not pretty standard. So, you know, you have a bent end pin, but then you go and you play a straight end pin, and that can be an adjustment. Players are flexible and can get used to it, but for, that's another reason why I haven't experimented with fifths tuning and that kind of thing. Also, I now just have one bass, mostly because I live in San Francisco in small quarters. I used to have two other basses, that that Lowendahl I mentioned earlier, and then I had a 1950s K bass. I sold both of those back when I was still in Chicago just because my wife and I started moving around, and there was a harp in the other room because she used to professionally play harp. So harp plus bass is already taking up a lot of our San Francisco condo and more basses, uh, probably not cool. I have an adjustable bridge and uh, these are some sort of plastic, possibly Delrin, I'm not sure. Uh, my luthier Pat McCarthy put these uh, white out dots and I think I have red dots on the other side uh, when he was doing some work on my bass. Gael, I believe, put this little uh, thing 
breathing in on the bridge right here on the foot because the bass was starting to get a little uneven. There is a little bit of sinking on this side of the bass, the left side that you're not seeing on the right side, but it has been that way pretty much since I had it. It does not seem to be uh, changing. Basses are dynamic things and do change over time. So when I go in to my luthier, which the advice I've always gotten is do it about once a year. Think of it as like an oil change. Uh, I, the, they look over and just make sure that everything's looking cool and do small adjustments and, and that sort of thing. But by and large, this bass has, has uh, been very good for me. There are a lot of battle wounds on this bass. Back when I wore the wrong kind of belt buckle, um, I got lots of scratches there. Uh, some of these are from the Lyric Opera Pit. I think that this one right here was from a giant plexiglass a thing on an outdoor gig flying off and thwacking my bass on the, on the top. Um, but, and, and at a certain point I will take it in and get some of the edges taken care of. Um, but, but it's, you know, that's just wear and tear on a base. I've had a couple of repaired cracks that, that I must've happened while Eric had the base. There's one here and I think there might be a rib crack that's either repaired or something. I can't remember where that is. I have had one open seam once. Ever. It's insane that I've had so little maintenance. Aaron Riley, the great bass luthier, he literally had me pull my bass out on the street in Evanston, Illinois, and he just like took care of it right there. It was super quick and easy. And um, yeah, other than that, seems to handle uh, really well. I have wheeled it hundreds of miles probably around San Francisco uh, on a base wheel and hundreds more and have had no problems at all. I've taken it through the snow. It's, it's been in the rain more than it should be. Um, and yeah, it's really just super duper stable and, and fun to play. And I guess it's expensive, but you know, it's just sort of like what instruments cost these days. And I feel lucky to have this bass. Uh, I know a lot of people search long and hard for for a bass, and even once you find a modern bass, you know, all basses will settle in and change a little bit over time. So finding the perfect bass is never easy, and I do have an entire resource I put together on finding a bass for you. I will link up to that here, and we'll see you in the next one.